So it really doesn't matter except that you be here. But I want to say this. You'll find out that you can't come to this church and not be touched by the prison across the street. We've definitely got a calling to be there. And you all know that. Those of you who have been here for some time, you know that. We're very much involved in it. In fact, on your tables, you see these prayer requests. These are meant for you. If you have a private prayer request, I mean, a lot of times we'll take open public prayer, of course, pray over things as you want us to. But then there's times there might just be things you want us to pray about. When I say us, I mean me. We can't do that with the prison. These are the same, these are the same prayer requests that go out to the prison every Sunday night. And that goes to about 135 different men. And uh, Ben, if you don't know Ben, he's the good-looking man in the white shirt in the back. Ben, <laughs> hoorah, right? And uh, in case you haven't figured it out, we got a Marine up there. Hoorah. There you go. You'll hear that every once in a while. And another Marine right here. But anyway, uh, if you feel so led to be part of that ministry, um, we get more of these. I can't pray over all these. There's too many of them. Uh, so when it comes to Sunday, I give them to Ben, and then Ben distributes to those who have wanted to make this part. If you feel like you have a call to intercessory prayer, we ask that you would do this. Uh, become part of that, and Ben will see that you're clued in on that. And uh, always with intercessory prayer, the hard thing is we don't always hear the results. People are good at asking for prayer, but not all the time giving, us, giving God the glory for when it's done. You know, we just accept that it's done. Uh, but anyway, and if you have a personal prayer request and want us to pray over, uh, if you would, just put it in the offering baskets. That's another thing, too, that's a little maybe, I, I don't know if we're odd. I don't, haven't attended other churches in a lot of years, but, you know, we don't take up an offering here because we believe your offering is between you and God. And that's up to you. And the, that's, that is your discipleship. That is your responsibility between you and God to uh, bring your tithe and offerings to him. And... Uh, I can honestly say for a church that's been here 40 years, there's never been one, one time that we've preached for money. It doesn't happen. Because uh, that's such a big criticism of churches that we're not going to allow it in any way, shape, or form. So whatever you do is between you and the Lord, and uh, the Lord never lets us down. Amen? The papers you're going to need this morning, we're going to conclude where we were in uh, the one that begins at the top. But I trust the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. Uh, we're going to be picking up further down in there uh, 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 where it says, yet indeed, I also count all things. And then we'll move on from that. Um, let's just pray. Lord, we pray because we'd be remiss not to. Because Holy Spirit, you inspired this word. We believe that with all our heart. We believe that you wrote this word, you inspired this word, you gave us this word, you picked the words, you chose the words. And Lord, we ask you, the author of these words, to be here. Open up our heart to receive the engrafted word that will bear fruit, that we'll be better witnesses, that we will accomplish the purposes of God in our lives. So Holy Spirit, we yield to you, sir, to be here, to bring your great power, to bring your authority, as you do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to learn this day. We just ask your help. We receive that. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, today's teaching, if we don't have kind of a settled understanding, isn't going to make a lot of sense. And when I say a settled understanding, I, that we, if, if you don't believe that you have a call from God on your life, this isn't going to make sense today. But if you believe that every person has a purpose and was created with a purpose for a reason, for a result that God Almighty has ordained before the foundation of the world in your life and my life, then we need to pay attention. Because sometimes we think of our purposes in a greater thing, a greater group. I'm talking about a personal purpose from God. Because when it comes down to it, when it comes down to it, we're not going to be graded as a church. We're going to be graded as individuals as we sit in the judgment seat of Christ, which is not a, a judgment of salvation, but is a judgment of what we have done in this body with the gifts He has given us for His glory. So that, and if you believe that, that's why we need to pay attention to today. You know, I find Paul to be... One of the oddest characters in the New Testament. He's, he's a unique individual. And uh, I think, looking at Paul, that if Paul had not had the experience he had on the road to Damascus, 
that we still would have heard of Paul, but it would have been as Saul. The reason I'm saying that is we're going to find out that much of what Paul has to say is based on his life experiences. Many of the Greek words that come into play here come into play through, for instance, um, um, a lot of times through the legal systems. He'll use words that were used in the legal system. He will use accounting terms. We're going to see that today. He, he uses an accounting term. And if you don't understand that, you don't really understand what he's trying to say. Because I think Paul was a businessman. I think he was a wealthy man. I, I think the, wor- the world would have heard of Saul if it hadn't heard of Paul, and it wouldn't have been good. He is, I mean, one of the most stubborn, determined men that's going to accomplish his purposes. And at one time, he was, of course, accomplishes were against God's will, um, met the Lord Jesus Christ on that road to Damascus. And again, we have a hard time relating to that because we, we come from, most of us come from non-salvation to salvation, from, you know, really not knowing who God was, really didn't care who God was until the Holy Spirit got a hold of us and we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. But for Paul, it was different. Paul left behind a whole lot. I mean, he left, uh, for, for Paul, he was really stripped of his whole history, stripped of all he was, stripped of everything he believed. And I have a hard time with that because I, I can't even imagine that because I haven't had to go through it. I just went from stupidity to Christ. He went from probably very wealthy, you know, I mean, somebody had to pay that he could sit at the feet of Gamaliel and learn. He was a noted rabbi. And I just think there was so much to Paul's life. And my personal opinion is the Bible doesn't tell us why he sat in darkness for three days after that meeting with Christ. But I think it took three days in the dark just for him to recoup a little bit and get his senses back when you find out that everything, single thing that you believe is wrong. You might remember I tried, I was probably in a dumb way, to make that real because I, I want us all to try to maybe empathize, empathize a little bit with, with Paul. And if you'll remember, I came in and I, I announced to you that it was, a, it was an announced on the radio and on television this week, in case you had missed it, that they had found the tomb of Jesus Christ and his skeleton was there. They found the bones of Christ. And uh, some of you are about ready to pick up, pack up, and walk out of here, which is exactly what you should do if I ever preach that. But I was just trying to make it real because I didn't smile. I tried to make it real because that, it, would, it, it would be something like that if you understood that everything that you believe about Christ is wrong you'd have an understanding of what Paul was going through. And in Paul's case, it was wrong. And so it's kind of hard to understand this man who has been stripped of everything uh, to be the man that he is. So we're going to talk about this a little bit today. We're going to pick up where it says, and you have to excuse me, I have so many notes written over my notes, it's hard for me even to see which one I'm looking at. We're looking at Philippians 3, 8, and 9, almost to the bottom of your first page. Paul writes this, he says, Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Notice he says indeed. Very strong word in the Greek. Very strong word of, ap- of uh, uh, and, uh, a strong uh, word of uh, intent. He says, I indeed, I, uh, without a doubt, without any doubt at all, I also count all things. That, that word isn't just considering all things. That word count, counting all things is, is a term uh, that was used in, in the world of bookkeeping and uh, business. In fact, it actually, the word in the Greek means he took an inventory. That's going to become very important today. He took an inventory. He said, and in that inventory, he said, I have put all things in the lost column. He's, he's talking again almost like an accountant. In accounting, you either have profit or you have loss. And he has moved every, he's saying everything that he had, everything that he knew, everything that he had studied for, everything that he'd lived his life for, he counted all things lost. He put it in the lost column. For what? Because he found out that the one thing he wanted more than anything else is the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. You look at that and you think, my goodness, how he went from hating the church, killing members of the church, holding the robes of those men that stoned Stephen to death in the early times. He says, I indeed count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and yet I count them rubbish that I may be rubbish. That word rubbish has two different meanings in the Greek. It means uh, dung, if you will, and it also means uh, f- uh, filthy, uh, filth from a dog. So it's, it's a very hard word, and he, say, he says, I count them all rubbish. You know, we didn't have, at least in my life, I didn't have anything really to count rubbish because I wasn't really believing in anything when I, until I believed in Christ. But Paul had to give up everything that he believed, everything that he'd been taught, everything that he'd been read, everything that he was focused on. Uh, everything, you know, he probably would have ended up being some great rabbi in Jerusalem with, the, with his mind. I mean, I would love to, have, to know what Paul's IQ was. It had to be tremendous besides the anointing of God on his life. He says, he, he counts all these things as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness. Because he was found in his own righteousness. That's the thing he's playing back to. On the road to Damascus, Jesus met him in his unrighteousness and what Paul called his righteousness. If you'd have asked Paul before that light shone on him, before that voice spoke out of heaven, if you'd have asked Paul how he's doing, he said, I'm doing great. I'm clothed in, the, in righteousness. He's clothed in the righteousness that was the law. It was a righteousness of his own making, and he had pride in it. He based it on the law, and he based it on the fact of all the things that he had done, keeping the law. He may, and this is why he says he would rather have that righteousness of Christ than the righteousness he had. And, he, and for him, this was a big turn to move this from column A, where everything was a plus, and this is what I live for, and this was profitable, and this was good, and move it into the lost column and said, I don't mind putting it into the lost column because what I put into the plus column is the knowledge of Christ, and there is nothing greater greater in this nice life than in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what he was saying. So the Lord found him and what he, what he thought was his righteousness was actually the filth of his own way. And he said here, he said, I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. Now, again, I want to share with you for those who haven't heard it. I go back to a survey that was taken several years ago now, a survey that was done by Christ for the Nations down in Texas. And it was a very disturbing survey, and I would think the way things are going has probably gotten worse than better. And what they did was they sent their kids out around the neighborhoods to do a survey. And in this survey, they only asked two questions. They asked, number one, are you a Christian? They didn't care about denomination. They weren't trying to get into that. It didn't matter. So they had, they had answers that came from across the spectrum, from the you know, denominational churches to the independent churches to, to anybody that, that, that claimed to have a, a, a Christian faith. Uh, they did this survey with. And once they determined that the person was a Christian, they only had one. If you weren't a Christian, they didn't ask you. They just went their way. But if you said you were a Christian, they only had one question. This is real, folks. There was one question. They said, they said that we want to ask you one question. If you died today, if you died right now and stood before a holy God, and he said, why should I allow you into my kingdom, my heaven, what would you say? 92%. 92%. Of Christians who said they were Christian, who acknowledged that they were Christian, said, because I've tried to be good. That's the best our churches can do. We ought to turn them into filling stations. I wonder where we're at today with the great falling away that is happening right in front of our faces right now. Who was it that told me this morning? Ben, was it you said that they, there was a report out that of, of a church in Germany that's using artificial intelligence now to do all its preaching. It's coming, folks. It's coming faster than we can comprehend. But it's interesting that Paul says that he counts all, all, the, all that he had, all, all that he was proud of, all that he thought was righteous, he counts it as rubbish, that he might gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness. You know, and, and so we, we look at Paul as an example, but look at where we're at. If 92%, that means only, that means only out of 100 Christians, only 8 got it right. Only 8 Christians were able, you know, how would you answer that question? Hopefully you would say, because of Jesus Christ my Lord. You sent your son, I believe your son died for me, and I believe that's why I'm going to spend eternity with you. It has nothing about myself. How can we get that so wrong? One of the hardest things about the Christian faith is there isn't anything for you to do towards faith. Religion is always something for you to do. But it's never Christ plus anything. He says, I count them all as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness. Which is exactly what these... When you say that I'm going to go to heaven because I've tried to be good. 
And they weren't being smug about it. They weren't thinking that they were great people. They just, they just the thought was, well, I haven't killed anybody. Well, I haven't stole from anybody. Or, you know, I know this person over there claims to be a Christian, and I'm much better than they are, so I think I'm, you know, I'm okay. I, I've tried to be good, and so I'll get into heaven. That is your own righteousness that comes from the law, the law being the ability of the, your, your ability to think that you can keep the righteousness of God. He says, but that which is through faith in Christ, the right, he, I want to be found in the righteousness that is in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Notice here, I want you to make a note there in your Bibles or, or on your papers, if you will, that righteousness is not something that God demands. Righteousness is not something God demands. Righteousness is a gift of God. He doesn't demand you to be righteous, per se. He provides the righteousness that we can have. This is where, you know, people, again, this, this idea that, that we manufacture our righteousness. You know, we accept it because Christ has done it for us. It's a free gift of grace into our lives. And as I said before, how do, how do we know? How do we know that the Father wants everyone to be saved? Because, again, it's because, you know, let, let me talk about another issue that's popping up in the churches. It just popped up in Troy down the road here a couple months ago. That there are churches, even mainline churches, that are preaching the uh, predestination. Predestination in the sense uh, of, of almost pure uh, Calvinism, that God determines who's going to be uh, saved and who's not. And I have a real problem with that, because it wipes out so many other scriptures. And doing a close study of the Word and a close study of Romans, you find out that the, you know, the, we talk about the sovereignty of God, and God is absolutely sovereign. God has His right to have His will and to do it His way. Can I get an amen on that? But what is His way? How do we know? How do we know what God's way is? What did He choose? He doesn't choose people, but He chose the plan of salvation. He chose that it would be by faith in His Son. That's what God predetermined. And He will not be moved off of that, because He cannot be moved off of that. And again, I want to just encourage you as part of your witness, when people want to say to you that you Christians are narrow-minded and you're unloving, you always teach that the only way to God is through Christ. And I believe there's all kinds of ways. God's a big God. And there's all kinds of ways to reach Him. But even that in your thought is wrong because what you're missing is the whole purpose and the meaning of salvation. Salvation comes to the Christian because of the grace of God coming into our lives. But you've got to get past it. What, what does it mean? What, what happened out of that? What happened out of that is we got a new nature. The, the problem is not sin itself. It's the problem is the sin nature that causes the sin. And, the, and, the, and the only, Christianity is the only Christ, uh, religion in the world that offers the answer to that, which is a changed nature through Jesus Christ. So when we, say to, when we say to people that their only way to Christ, the only way to God is through Jesus Christ, He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. We're not being narrow-minded. We're just telling you that if you understand the science of salvation, the process of salvation, without Christ it cannot happen because without Christ there's no new nature. And if there's no new nature, there's no Christianity, there's nobody saved, and nobody's going to heaven. So thank God in Christ we get a new nature. We get to start over. That is one of the most pleasant things you can preach across the street, is you don't have to live in that past. You can be a whole new person in Christ Jesus. Oh, somebody say amen. This is what it's all about. Paul goes on to say in Philippians 3.10, he says that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. He says that I may know Christ that I may know Him, that I may know the power of His resurrection, that I may know and be conformed to His death. To know Him. Righteousness, again, is a gift from God, but it's, a, it's, it's, the, it's the launching pad into relationship with God. It's another thing that you want to stress so much is that God wants that personal relationship with us. You know, again, once in a while I get, all, all I want to do in, is preach the gospel. I want to preach the word of God. And when you preach the word of God, sometimes people think you're anti this or anti that, but you're not. You're just pro-Bible. And uh, to understand that salvation is all of God and not anything that we do of ourselves and that Paul wants to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. In other words, it's like Paul wants the whole thing. You know, he gives himself as hard to Christ as he gave himself to the law. 
Christ is now the focus of his life and, and Paul being the man that he is, the go-getter that he is, the, the determined man that he is, wants everything. He wants to know, he wants to know him. He wants to know the power of his resurrection. He wants, he wants to, you know, should we should all have that drive that he has. Paul is saying, whatever Christ has to offer, I want to walk in it. I don't want to come short in anything. I want to fulfill all of it. I want to know all of it. I want to walk in all of it. I want to be able to teach all of it. I want to be part of all of it. I want to know his sufferings. I want to know him. I want to know, I want to be conformed to his death. He understood what the resurrection meant. He said, if, you know, if, if by any means possible, uh, with all that, that he can do, with all his determination, with all his faith, he's going to walk in what Christ has provided for him to walk in, as should we all. Now, I want to give you a little different aspect as we go on to the next page here. As we look at Philippians 3.12, I want to give you a little different aspect of this than maybe you've heard before. Because Paul goes on to say in that 12th verse up the top of that page, he says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ has laid hold of me. He says, I haven't already attained. Let me, let me start by saying this. Find my note here. If you think about how the Philippian letter begins, Paul talks about kind of being caught in a tug of war. And you've got to understand that for this to make sense. He says, it's better off to leave here and be with the Lord. He said, that's far better. But then he also had the pull of working with people still and trying to bring fruit into their lives, trying to take them deeper into Christ. But you look at Paul by this time of his life. He's a prisoner. He's in Rome. He's in chains. Not all his time was spent in chains, but a lot of his time was. Sometimes chained to a Roman guard. And he's in, he's in a tug of war. He says, should I stay or should I go? In fact, if you really look at the Greek close enough, it's almost like, if you know what tug of war is. We'd have a rope here and there'd be a team here and a team here. Well, Paul felt like the rope. He wasn't on particularly anybody's team. He was trying to find out what, what to do. And you had, you had one side pulling that Paul should stay and, and, and continue to work with the church and you know, be the apostle that he's been. And the other side of that is him saying, I want to go home. You know, Paul could, have, Paul could say at that point in his life, I've written more gospel than any other apostle. I've traveled further than any other apostle. I've set more things in order than any other apostle. Why can't I quit and go home? What about you? This is going to come down to a question to you and I. Today, you're going to be asked the question, I believe very closely, that you're going to be asked when you sit at the judgment seat of Christ. And don't think for a moment, the Bible makes it clear, Paul made it clear. Every one of us is going to sit at that judgment seat. It is not a judgment of righteousness. It's not a judgment of salvation. In fact, it is supposed to be a happy time, a great time, where Christ hands out rewards for what we've done. It's, it's kind of like payday. You want to say, well, I'm not doing this for the pay. I'm not doing this for the reward. Well, you may not be, but God's looking at it for a reward. There are things that we're going to be rewarded for doing. And it's going to be important that we... See, it's going to be important. Let me get into this. <laughs> it be easier just to do this. I just want you to understand this, the, the dilemma that Paul's in, this tension, okay? Do I go home and be with the Lord? Have I finished my work? You know, don't I, don't I have the right to go home? Don't I have the right to rest? Don't I have the right to say, I've done it, it's finished, I can go home? Versus, do I stay and do more? So he says this, just what you just read. He says, not that I have already attained or already been perfected, but I press on. That word attained in the Greek is katalambano. Now get, the, get this with me. You might want to make this note on your notes there. It means to tackle, to conquer, to subdue, to master something. Let me say that again. It means to tackle, to conquer, to subdue, to master something. What Paul is saying here is he says, I haven't conquered or mastered yet everything that God has given me to do. He's, he's explaining his decision because he does, he does earlier in the letter say, I'm going to stay. I've been in the midst of this tug of war. I've tried to see it from both sides. 
He said, but it really doesn't matter what I think. He said, when I look at what God has given me to do, I can tell you yet, I have not yet attained. Paul's saying, for all that work, for all that travel, for all those writing of epistles, when he looks at the command that only perhaps he knows the best, that Jesus Christ gave him to fulfill, he says, I have not yet attained. I haven't conquered it. I haven't mastered it. I haven't come to full fruition. It hasn't come to maturity yet. And that's how he saw it. I haven't conquered, I haven't mastered yet everything Christ has given me to do. He has started more churches than anyone else. He's made more disciples. He has written more, more of Scripture. He has set more things in order than any other apostles. But the thought of death, and actually the thought of death pleases him to go home, to have, be done with it, to rest. It would be nice to just slip away and be with Jesus. But when he weighs what he's accomplished against the orders of Christ, there are still things that are untamed, that are unmastered, that are unfinished. And as much as he would love to be with the Lord, there's more to do. And I'm going to ask the question, what does that say about your life and mine? What does it say about your life and mine? If you believe that you have a call on your life, if you believe you have an assignment in Christ, where are you on that when you take a, a, a hard look at what you've done in your life? Sometimes we think just by age we have the right to retire. Is it that we have the right to retire or do we have a duty to refire? What's our attitude? Do we think age gives us an out? Can you look, and only you can answer this. Only you can look at your life. Only, only, I know I haven't accomplished everything the Lord wants me to do. That's not bragging on me. I'm bragging on Him that He's got things for me to do. And I'm going to answer for it. And I don't want to say I quit early. I don't, you know, I know one thing. I'm going to teach until he, I can't teach anymore. Until he says no. But until he says no, we've got to say yes. So do you, under, do you understand? You know, I think people were, were look, always looked at these verses as kind of a, a judgment on their character. And I have not yet attained, but I keep pushing on, you know, to be deeper into Christ and everything. Paul's talking about his responsibility here. He uses again these terms of an accountant. He says, I've, I, I've, I've inventoried this. In fact, let's, let's re read down here. He says, Paul, Paul, um, Paul adds, I'm not perfected yet. It is the word teleos, complete, mature. Paul is saying, I have not yet brought my assignment to the place of maturity. I've done a lot, but I'm not there yet. There's more to do. In light of his consideration, he says, but I press on. Some tra translators say, I follow after. That Greek word where he says here, he says, uh, but I press on. Not that I am already perfected, not that I'm already complete, not that I have yet attained, not that I have yet conquered what he's given me to do fully, but I press on. That word press on is a hunting term. You might want to write that. Again, he, he uses terms, you know, used in the general lifespan, uh, lifetimes of the people around there that they would relate to. When he used those words, a person from that day and age would understand that Paul was talking about a hunting term here. This was, this was a term a hunter would use when he's, he's prepared himself, he's gotten you know, all his weapons together, he's gotten all his traps together, he's got all, all his bait together, and he's going to go out hunting, and he is not going to come back until he catches that which he's going out to do. If you've got that picture of the hunter that's on the trail, nothing's going to stop him, nothing's going to take him off the trail. He's going to follow that animal until he finally bags that animal. You get the idea what the Greek word means here. Paul says, I'm going to pursue, and I'm going to pursue, and I'm going to pursue what God has me to do until I finally attain it, until I finally master it until I finally conquer it. That was the way Paul was. And that's the way Paul was in everything in life. Anything he set his hand to, he was going to master it. He was going to conquer it. Even if it meant, you know, could he have chosen to go home? Obviously, the Spirit was telling him, well, the door's open, Paul, if you want to come home. But then also working with him to look at what God had commanded him to do and saying that he has not yet completed everything that God had given him. that he may finish his work with all deliberation. He will not stop until he has mastered, he has conquered, he has subdued the call of God on his life. He says that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. You know, he remembers his salvation that day on the Damascus Road, that moment when Jesus apprehended him. See, what he's saying is here, is he says, I want to apprehend, I, I, he, he wants to apprehend Christ, but he also wants to apprehend his duty to Christ. 
He wants, to, he wants to accomplish what Christ has given him to do as, as just as much as Christ conquered him on the road to the you, Put that scenario down. Somehow write that down in your notes because it's important. The drive, what, what, was, what was Paul's drive? What was, his, what was his want? What was his desire? His desire is that I conquer the things that God has given me to do in the way that he conquered me. And how did, God, how did Christ conquer him? Absolutely, totally, completely. That in a moment of time he went from hating Jesus to calling him my Lord. That's being conquered. So I want us to think about this today. And again, it's a question only you can answer. We do things corporately as a church that are good. Every one of you that is supporting, you know, you're supporting across the street, and you're not all going to be able to go over there. We know it took me a year to get in over there. It doesn't happen overnight. But we're able to teach, we're able to work with these men, we're able to help them, uh, we're able to help them when they get out, things that we're doing, uh, and so on. But we do it together. Paul says, Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended. He's writing to the brethren and sisters of the church. He says, I don't count myself. There again is an accounting term. It means to take an inventory. He says, when I take an inventory of what God has commanded me to do, he says, I find I fall short. I don't count myself to have apprehended. I haven't, I, that word apprehended is the same word as katalambamo, same word that I haven't mastered, that I haven't conquered, that I haven't subdued all of it. Counting is a business term. It's an accounting term. Paul is saying, brothers, I have taken an inventory of myself and I can tell you that I'm out of balance. I haven't fully apprehended or fully conquered or fully accomplished what the Lord has commanded me to do. Notice that Paul says that he has counted himself. It doesn't say he counted others. This is an important thing. Because a lot of people, if you ask them to give an account. Where do you stand in, in God's calling in your life? Where do you stand in the assignment God has given you? And a lot of times what people do is they have a tendency to look at other people and judge themselves by other people. Well, I, I know I'm more righteous than that one and I know I've done more and this one over here doesn't lift a finger in the church and I know I've done that and, you know, I, I, so I'm doing much better. Paul says you don't count other people. Jesus, Jesus is not going to count other people and say, yeah, skip there. There were some people that were, weren't quite as good as you. That isn't going to happen. He's just going to say, skip, what have you done? What have you done with the giftings and call that I have given you upon your life? Give an account for it. Did you finish it up? We see later I, that in writing to Timothy that Paul indeed did finish it up. He says, I've been poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice of their faith. I love that. Would that that would be in every tombstone. Everybody one of us, Jesus tarries and we get buried. I wish that would be on all of our tombstones. Poured out for Christ. Nothing left. Nothing taken to heaven. Left it all here. Did the job. Filled it to, to Christ's command. And also to be honest when we have it and we know there's more work to do and to go ahead and do it for Christ. So he doesn't count others. Christ isn't going to count others. He's just going to look at our lives. And I don't mean to make that a hard thing. It's not a hard thing. It's the pleasure of serving the Lord. But sometimes people think that there's, you know, you don't have an individual calling on your life, but we all do. We were all created with purpose. Our names were called before the foundation of the world. Our hair color, our personalities, God formed us in the womb. He knitted us together the way he wants us to be for a certain thing. You will find out that you're not called to be everywhere. You're called to be somewhere. You're called to serve not everybody but somebody. There's a calling on your life. There's an assignment. All you have to do is ask the Lord. The Spirit will tell you. He'll show you. And it can come also through the uh, words of others. Many times other people will find and, and see your gifting before you do. I always said all gifting is accredited by the church. A person's not a pastor because they stand behind his pulpit and say they're a pastor. They're a pastor because that's such what you've seen done in their lives. Jesus said, the sheep will follow my voice. A stranger they won't follow.
Paul knows he has started again more churches, wrote more epistles, traveled far, farther than others, been through more stuff, probably has more pain, more, more scars to show. But that isn't the rule by which he appraises himself. He doesn't appraise his accomplishments that way. He can only, he can only compare what he has done against what Christ has called him to do. He doesn't compare himself to others. He might have thought it was okay to quit, to die, to, to, recon, to, recon, to reconcile, to go home, but he's not yet finished. He's taken his own inventory and he finds that he's lacking. Therefore, he, he forgets those things which are behind. That's another kind of odd way of phrasing things. He says in Philippians 3.15, the next verse down, He says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. We talked about that. He's done an inventory of himself, not of others, but of himself. He's talking specifically about himself. He says, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. Now, a lot of times when we think the forgetting, we may think that he's talking about forgetting a past, which is very true, which is very true. I always tell the men in the prison that you can't go forward looking in the, you can't drive forward looking in the rearview mirror. If you have placed, put your life under the blood of Christ, if you have asked for God's forgiveness, it is there. It is absolutely there. And that isn't even really what Paul's talking about. But you know, another thing that I tell the men is that sometimes your success, your success this goes for all of us, Sometimes your success is based on what you're willing to ignore. Say that again. Sometimes your success is based on what you're willing to ignore because the devil will not let you forget your failures. And if you live with them, if you play with them, if you keep going back and messing with that, you're not going to be able to go forward. So sometimes your success is going to be determined on what you can ignore. I always thought it was odd. I read a commentary years ago, whether it's true or not, but it was a thought that said that everywhere Peter would go, that they knew the story of his denial of Christ, that the little kids would gather around him as he was walking through the streets and go, cook-a-doodle-doo, cook-a-doodle-doo, just just to rub it in and make fun of him. They would never let it go. But Peter had to put that behind him. Peter had to ignore that. He had to walk past that. And there's things in your life and my life. Am I the only one that could say there's things in my life I need to forget? things I don't need to carry, things that are under the blood, things that are taken care of by Christ, I don't need to worry about it anymore. It doesn't exist. This is what Paul was saying. He says, I don't have my account of myself to prep for him, but one thing I do, I'm forgetting those things which are behind. But here also what he is saying is, he says, you know, he's, he's, he's taking the inventory. And this next point is really important. And that is you can't stand on yesterday's successes. That's what he's saying here. He says, he says not that I've apprehended this, but I keep pressing on. Forgetting those things which are behind. And now we think again, it can be applied to character. It can be applied to mistakes. But it also can be implied to what you've already done. For him. You know, Paul isn't bringing up, but, but Lord, don't you remember when I did this? Lord, don't you remember when I wrote this epistle? Lord, don't you remember when I traveled there? Don't you remember my time in the deep? Don't you remember the beatings that I took? Don't you remember this and that? He's saying, no, he said, putting all those things behind. Because if you dwell on that, when I was in purchasing for a large company, I mean, they they were flying me around the world to find sources in India and different places, Europe, back in those old days. And, you know, it, it was, you had to maintain a relationship with your suppliers. You were only as good as your suppliers. And uh, it was a dangerous type situation. The situation I was in, if we didn't get the right parts at the right time, and we shut down a Ford plant because we built the brake cables for the F-150, besides other things. But you have to understand, it was 365,000 brake cables a week. This is big stuff. This is big time. This is big money. This is millions of dollars. And if a supplier has a problem, that supplier doesn't deliver to you on time, and you shut the Ford plant down in Mexico, you pay for every worker's hourly wage until it comes back up, which at that time was $186,000 a minute. This is the way that world works. First tier automotive is tough, tough world. But once in a while, you would tell a supplier, they're always beating on you for price reductions, price reductions, price reductions. So we had to take that to our suppliers and said, can you knock 5% off the, off the price? Well, I've got to get this down 5%. At one time, they brought us all to a, 
uh, snow, a ski lodge in northern Michigan, and we thought, oh, this is kind of nice, you know. And then a guy walks in the room, our boss walks in the room from Detroit, and he just says, gentlemen, he said, every part you buy today has got to cost 5% less five years, five years from now. And if you can't do it, we'll get somebody who can. Well, we just about all wanted to just jump off the ski slope by that time, you know. But my point was this, is it was very easy for a supplier to come back to us and say, but don't you remember when you ran out of parts and we worked over the weekend and our people were on holiday and we brought them back in and we did this and we did that? And you'd have to say to them, no, I haven't forgot that, but that's yesterday. What are you doing for me now? And nobody likes to hear that. And God doesn't, God, Paul isn't saying God forgets what we've done. He knows what we've done, but he's also saying, if you haven't finished the job I've given you to do, putting those things behind... Because otherwise, that's what you're going to do. You're going to keep going back to, but when, but when, when I did, when I did, when I accomplished this, when I did that. No, it doesn't matter. That's all in God's logbook. It's all in your file in heaven, your rewards waiting for that. But he's saying this. He says, put away yesterday and get with today. What are you, you know, God has every right to say, I know you've done great things for me, but what are you doing for me now? None of us get to rest on our laurels. Paul couldn't rest on his laurels. Paul couldn't rest and say, Lord, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. He's taken a firm, hard look at himself and he said, I have not yet conquered, mastered, fully attained everything that God has told me to do. So putting all that behind, I keep pressing for that upward call in Christ Jesus. Those are racing terms. Paul was also much into sports. And you've, you've seen runners, long distance runners, when they finally get to that rope and they just throw themselves forward, they stick their chest out, they do anything they can to get across, break through that ribbon and get across that line. That's what Paul's saying here in the Greek. He says, I press on and I press on towards the goal. Because I know I haven't done enough. I know I haven't accomplished everything. This is the type of teaching today that you just have to apply personally. I can't answer for how you're going to respond to this. Because only you know where you are in the calling that God has put on your life. But it might not hurt to just pray and say, Lord, let's do an inventory. Because I want to make sure I'm seeing it right. And besides the fact, who wants to sit around on their laurels anyway? There's so much to do in the kingdom of God. So much to do. So leaving those things which are behind. Treating it as almost it doesn't exist anymore. And then we go on to the next verse. Philippians 3.15. And he simply says this. Therefore, let as many of us who are mature have this mind. He's telling us his definition here of what a sound mind is. He said, all who are mature think this way. So if we want to count ourselves as mature in Christ, this is the way we need to think. Paul doesn't pull any punches, does he? He's not afraid to say, if, this, if you're mature, this is the way you're going to think. He says, all mature Christians will think like this. They'll appraise themselves. They'll take an inventory. They'll take it before God. And they'll say, what do we need to do? What do you, what do we, what do you want me to accomplish? What do you have for me? Because I'm not telling you, you take your ideas to God. I've tried that. It doesn't work. You always heard the old expression, you want to hear God laugh, telling you you got a plan. It's very true. But what God looks for is those that have an open heart that just want to say, Lord, what have you commanded me to do? What do you have for me to do? And even if I've accomplished it, if I finish that, Lord, I'm still here. And while I'm still here, while I still draw breath, while I'm here, what can I do for you? He says, let all of us who are of a mature mind think this same way. Then he goes on to say, well, he takes it one step further in, ver in verse 317. He says, brethren, join in following my example and, and note those who so walk. Take, pay attention to those who, who live the same way because you have them as a pattern. In other words, Paul says, not only are you going to have a mature mind to think this way, he says you're going to be maturity and that you act this way and that we will set a pattern for the rest of the church. I don't know about you, but Paul set a pattern for me today. This is something to think about. We don't often talk about stopping long enough to take an inventory and say, Lord, where are we? Where are we with you? And you might say, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. Well, a lot of us are in that boat. But the thing to do there is we just bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, you direct me. We're not bringing his, we, do, we don't want to bring him his ideas. You know, Jesus said he's going to build his church and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. I had to learn a long time ago, I can't build a church, only he can. And so he will set the ministries, he will, he will take care of those things, he will set the vision, and he'll bring us the resources to do it. So I'm going to end with that thought today. 
Do we all have a mature mind? Do we all have an idea here? I don't want this to be something we forget 10 minutes down the highway. I want, I want you to take this home tonight. I want you to take it to bed tonight. I want you to look at the ceiling tonight when you're in bed. And I want you to ask him, Lord, where do we stand? If, if you inventoried me, Lord, where are we? Have I finished what you've given me to do? If I've not, show me, teach me, guide me, put it all together. Create the, the sequences of life that will cause your purposes. Because it's, remember, it's him that says he'll cause you both to will and to do his good pleasure. But we're not going to give up. Amen? we got a lot to do. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your servant, Paul, that you raised up. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the guidance and wisdom that you gave him that comes down through the ages to us. Lord, help us to know what our purpose is. Lord, help us to take an inventory of our lives, not of others, but of ourselves. Are we resting in our laurels? Are we resting on the accomplishments of yesterday? Do we have the right to say it's enough? Or should we say, Lord, as long as you let breath go through my body, as long as my spirit stays in my body, as long as you want me to, we will do your will. Just reveal your will. If we're off track, put us on track, Lord. Maybe we need a faith alignment to take our faith in the promises of God where you'd have us to go with them. Lord, nothing is more exciting than serving you, particularly as we get into these end days and these end hours. There's so much to do to be part of this generation, the most prophesied generation in history. Lord, help us to accomplish your will, to do your purposes, to love one another, to encourage one another. We can't run each other's race, but we can sure help each other get to the end line. We can encourage, we can scream far, we can help you, we can encourage you. We can love you and expect the same in return as we love each other across the finish line of this life that we may all stand before him and say that we have done well, Lord, that you can say that to us, that we've been found faithful, that we have conquered, that we have mastered the purpose of our creation. We ask it, Father, to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, beloved.